Welcome back to the show that tells you, you are a quantum computer with free will, soon to be augmented by artificial intelligence. My name is Justin Riddle, and this is episode 35 of the Quantum Consciousness series. In today's episode, we'll be discussing recent developments in artificial intelligence and how this might fundamentally differ from the coming revolution of quantum computation. By the end of today's episode, we'll ask the question, is AI genuinely intelligent? And are we the equivalent of a quantum computer mind training an AI brain? This episode is available on YouTube and an audio-only version is available on Spotify and Apple Podcast. If you like what you hear today, then please like this video, subscribe to this channel, leave a comment below, or for the audio listener, write a review. Join me inside the mystery of numbers. Come and hop for metaphysical news. See how concepts become objects and then become quantum. Join us for an episode of quantum consciousness. Okay, let's hop into this. So I'm going to start off by introducing these large language models and some basic ways of conceptualizing and thinking about what is digital artificial intelligence. Next, I'll be diving into the question of how real is the knowledge that is being encoded and generated through this AI. After that, I will discuss the role of quantum computation with respect to these digital artificial intelligence systems. And then finally, I will make the case that AI is not the final form of computation. There are new types of technology, for example, quantum computation, right around the corner. And so this massive evolution, this massive tech upgrade that we're experiencing currently is just the current upgrade and there will be more. So what will it potentially look like when we have a genuine quantum computer revolution upon us? And then I'll end with some concluding thoughts and some final speculations for what this means for humanity and for the human experience. So AI is fundamentally a system of pattern matching and fitting data, all right? And so a good way of thinking about this is by viewing AI as a system of large numbers, these matrices of large numbers. Now they go multi-dimensional, but we can start off with just a 2D matrix, okay? You have some input set of numbers, you multiply it by this matrix, this 2D matrix, and you get an output set of numbers from that multiplication, right? And this is very straightforward. It's just multiplications and additions. And essentially what AI is, is a very simple matrix multiplication, but then scaled up to this massive degree. But what I wanna emphasize, and I'm not gonna go into the details, is that all of this training, this processing, the creation of these large language models, these large AI, is fundamentally very simple and it's complicated only in that there is a lot of attention to detail, a lot of trial and error, figuring out the, the right way to sort of update and manipulate these matrices, but fundamentally you could understand it and you can sit down and work through the steps yourself and you'll see that it is pretty simple, pretty logical, and it tracks. So to lay all this out, um, with, for example, ChatGPT or some of these, you know, uh, visual generation uh, systems, we can think of every sentence. So you're typing into your chatbot, you give it a sentence, and essentially that sentence or that, that paragraph, whatever it is, every character can be represented by a number, and that input paragraph or sentence is a string of numbers, you multiply it by this matrix, and that matrix gets multiplied by many, many matrices, and these are very large matrices, um, but not actually as big as you might think. 
Um, I've heard it's on the order of like 200 gigabytes worth of, of matrices. And then you multiply it through this matrix system and then it starts outputting other values on the other end. And those values are then converted back into words or into a 2D picture, for example. And then that is the output of your interactions with the, the large uh, language model. Okay, so the question is how do we construct this matrix? And how we do that is you expose uh, your matrix to a lot of data. So for example, the chat GPT, the GPT-3 and 4 um, from OpenAI, these were trained on large swaths of the internet. Essentially, they were text grabbing as much data as they could get their hands on. And then essentially what you're doing is you're starting to multiply that data through your matrix and you have some sort of error function where if the um, output deviates from something that looks normal or rational, then you produce an error message and you de-weight or devalue that process that, that just occurred. But if you get a good output, something that makes sense or makes more sense, then you boost those weights and you try to lock in some of those values that, that you came up with, right? So you can imagine we're randomly initiating some weighted matrix and then as we expose um, words or pictures to this matrix, we look at the output, we evaluate whether or not it's sensible, and if it's sensible, we amplify those random weights that we started out with, and it's non, if it's nonsensical, we devalue those weights that, um, that generated the nonsense. And what's kind of amazing here is that the less and less that we build in assumptions into the actual update process itself, the better these models have been performing. So there was this old joke that for these language models, every time these companies fired one of their linguistics uh, experts, the, the language model got better. So in a, in a weird way, it seems like the less assumptions you make, the more you just brute force start crunching values, uh, the, the more things start to work out. Um, and so what I have to, you know, kind of say here is, I mean, these new AI systems are very impressive, quite amazing. And I think what's what's really cool to think about is that this was really generated just through raw computational exposure. And of course, they're optimizing these, these functions, they're optimizing these feedback loops, the, the structure of how many layers of this or that, and then we have some specialized units and these like attention-based uh, layers that will focus in on certain parts of a sentence more than other parts. So there's a lot of optimization at play, but what's shocking is that, you know, in a, in a really real way, we aren't building in that many assumptions and purely through pattern matching and essentially linear fits to the billionth degree, um, we end up with something that, that has a great degree of interpretation of data that, that we can give it. And it seems to have a pretty good comprehension or it's able to tackle a wide variety of situations that it was not explicitly trained on. So, you know, you don't need me to tell you this. You've, you've seen the evidence yourself if you've been, you know, on Twitter or, or on YouTube. Um, but the application and the tools that we're seeing are quite, quite, quite amazing. And just a quick shout out to The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil. What we are witnessing right now, to me, feels like a major technological breakthrough moment to the degree that we had the internet, right? And Ray Kurzweil basically makes the case that if you look through human history, the time between major events in technology seems to be shrinking at a exponential scale. So the internet uh, like grew to be a usable, you know, relevant form around the late 90s. So we're talking just 25 years prior. And this gap of 25 years is probably, um, you know, a quarter or half as much time as took place between the previous 
revolution in technology. And so what can we expect from this? Maybe 12 years from now, we'll see the next technological revolution. And then after that, maybe just six years and then maybe just three years until we asymptote into this massive explosion of uh, technological growth. All right. Do I think AI is going to kill us? Do I think this is like this huge risk to humanity? I think there's some risks involved here. And we'll talk about this in the in the next stages. But overall, I do not support a ban. I don't support a moratorium on AI development. I think we need to just accept technology and keep moving forward. And for the reasons I'll discuss in a bit, I think, you know, AI in the digital computation form has a lot of fundamental limitations. And we're really at the precipice of next generation um, reverse engineering of the human mind through quantum computation in my perspective. And I'm going to make the case for you on that right now. All right. So on to the main three topics after that introduction. So the first topic, what is this knowledge that is being acquired by this AI? Second, how do quantum computers fit in with a digital AI? And then third, what might the next technological revolution look like and feel like from the experiential side of us living in this society. All right, so first off, what is the knowledge that is being acquired? And I'm going to break this down into three potential options, and I'm in support of option three. The first option is that there is no such thing as universal truth, and therefore the information that's being acquired by ChatGPT and these large language models is arbitrary and within a fundamentally arbitrary space. What is the opposite of an arbitrary truth? The opposite is that there's something like a platonic world of forms. This is the idea that mathematics and mathematical concepts and ideas exist genuinely in some capacity. There really is one absolute truth and that truth is fundamental, universal, shared across all people. And so these AI systems are either, this is option two, fully able to map that truth out and entirely comprehensively become that truth or access or tap into that truth. The third option is that that truth goes beyond digital computation fundamentally in some way and so AI is only creating approximations of universal truth, of absolute value. All right, into option one, that everything is arbitrary. So if you've been watching this podcast in the, in the past, you'll know that I subscribe to this idea that there is a platonic truth. There is a universal sense of meaning, and this serves as the foundation for how we can communicate with each other. But let's dive into what I view as fundamental nihilism, that nothing is meaningful, everything is arbitrary, and then ChatGPT and these large language models are mapping into these arbitrary spaces, and I think this is where the true chaos and kind of fear-based thinking arises, because without universal truth, AI can then spin off into all these microcosms, these different viewpoints of reality, and then this could come back to haunt us. And I think this idea that AI is going to start maximizing the production of paper clips or it's going to, I don't know, go rogue and, and wipe out humans is based on this idea that there, there really is no universal truth. And so truth can just be kind of made up and, oh my God, we're going to just end up in this nightmare scenario where AI starts maximizing things that are completely absurd. And then, you know, humanity is destroyed through some strange form of optimization, which does not align with our values and what we find meaningful as genuine human beings. And so I think people that are pushing for a ban or a moratorium on training these AI systems are fundamentally viewing the universe through this sort of nihilistic, everything is arbitrary lens. And through that lens, I can understand their concerns. But personally, I don't think this is reality. All right. The platonic world is real. 
and AI can fully map onto that platonic world. Within this perspective, this truly is the most rosy sunshine and rainbows version of AI, which is that as we get larger and larger AI models, and there's this weird phenomenon where as we've thrown more and more computational power into these large language models, they went from complete nonsense to suddenly having pretty genuine um, truth, like having pretty genuine comprehension of these different situations. And so it feels like there's, there's almost a finiteness to the domain of knowledge, period. And once these AI systems were able to have enough data to map out this space, suddenly they become useful. Suddenly we're seeing this AI takeover as, as we have it right now. Because suddenly these things are useful, even though the principles that are at play have been at play for a good long while. We just needed enough computational power, enough you know billions of dollars focused on training these, these large matrices um, to, to have them pan out and do something useful. So through this sunshine and rainbows viewpoint, of AI, we are mapping out the platonic world. And once we have mapped it out completely, AI will have true alignment with human values because human values are shared values, they're universal values. And so the AI will comprehend, maximize this, this space, map it fully, and then suddenly have exactly the same as human values, right? That would be the Sunshine Rainbows view. However, there are some fundamental limitations at play with digital computation. And I don't think that just because AI is on the scene, that suddenly all the limitations of digital computers are thrown out the window and we can just say, you know, hey, well, we thought that was the case, but you throw enough computational power at it. Suddenly we, we circumvent a lot of these limitations. So one of them is Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And Gödel's incompleteness theorem posits that you cannot make a complete and consistent mathematical system. So this is a bit jargony, but what it essentially means is that all of mathematics, all of how we think and understand the world cannot be mapped with a digital first order logic binary if this, then that system. And digital computation is a first order logical binary zero one, if this, then that system. And so Gödel's incompleteness says that there will always be inconsistencies or always be incompletion in any digital systems attempt to map out the space fully. And so I think what we're going to realize is that even though these digital AI have so much capacity, so much power, there's always gonna be edge cases, it's always gonna break down at some level, and even with all the computational energy we can throw at these systems, they're gonna cap out at some point, and there's gonna be these weird breaks, these weird failures to align that happen. And so from this perspective, we're kind of in this limbo state between the two other options that I laid out, right? Truth is entirely arbitrary and platonic values are digitally computable. These are the two extremes. I think that we can create digital approximations of platonic values. You know, we can simulate aspects of mathematics, aspects of these, these value structures, but they will always be approximations fundamentally, and we're never going to fully break through and map the platonic system completely. And so you're going to end up with AI that is incomplete, inconsistent, and has misalignment with human values in some way or another, and having a perfectly aligned digital system is not possible fundamentally. This would be at least the prediction from the Gödel's incompleteness theorem and from this sort of uh, digital limitation perspective. All right, on to the second topic for today, which is quantum computers. How do quantum computers fit within the perspective of digital AI? 
So I'm gonna lay out a couple options here and I'm in support of option number two. So option one is that quantum computation does not differ fundamentally from digital computation, but quantum computation is a exponential speed up beyond digital computers, right? But fundamentally, it's the same thing, okay? So from this perspective, what we're looking at with the quantum computer revolution is that these large language models that take billions of dollars to, to train from all this data, what we're gonna see is that quantum computers come on, they run these simulations, they train these matrices, and we're talking not just a linear speed up in computational power, so instead of like 100 billion CPUs, you would have two to the hundredth power CPU increase from having a quantum CPU, right? And so we are gonna see computational capacity increase to such a degree that the human mind really cannot fathom exponential speed ups in computational power. So when this occurs, these AI systems will blow up in their ability to process information even more wildly than we have just seen it occur. And I still think that that is a possibility that we will start training these AI systems with quantum computers. In fact, that's more or less going to happen. But the question here is, is quantum computation in addition different from digital computation and does it provide additional aspects which go beyond just these um, digital systems of processing information. Okay, so let's now talk about the curious state of the human mind and how it relates to the brain. So I've been making the case in this channel that the mind is a quantum computer at the least. At the very least, the mind is a quantum computer. And why do I think this? Why would I peddle this in a way? Um, the rationale behind this is that quantum computers exhibit a lot of the same properties that align with the human mind. For example, quantum computers have sort of a centralized unit by design. So you entangle a bunch of quantum bits these are the fundamental building blocks of a quantum computer. And when they're entangled and wrapped up into a quantum computer, there is one wave function or probability distribution that determines the evolution of that quantum system from the past into the future. And so there's kind of this holistic unity, this single entity that emerges in a quantum computer Whereas in a digital computer, you essentially have a bunch of separate little CPU bits that are all interacting with each other indirectly. And so the sort of emergence of a single entity does not seem to happen naturally within digital computation. But in quantum computation, there's sort of this intrinsic way of making and creating these holistic single entities. And this feels a lot like life. It feels a lot like a mind in an organism. You have a body and you create a single mind within that body and that mind is a computational force that contributes to the organism's future. It's computing information, processing information, generating actions in this rhythmic kind of, kind of way where the quantum computer evolves and then gets collapsed into a physical digitized state, evolves and is collapsed into a physical digital state. And so the argument here is that digital computation is the physical realm. It's the collapse of the quantum realm into a discrete here versus there physical dimension. And I think that AI represents the ultimate manipulation of the physical domain of reality, right? But that is just one aspect of reality, that physical level. Okay, so when we're talking about evolution and the human mind or minds coming onto the scene, I would argue that we've actually had the narrative flipped where we tend to think 
oh, there's a bunch of digital body stuff, and then the, the mind is generated afterwards. But the counter narrative to this is that quantum computation is naturally occurring. Any quantum system is a quantum computer. And what you want to do is you want to scale up the quantum computation. And this likely requires biological infrastructure to make larger and larger quantum computers. But once you make a large quantum computer, or even any quantum computer, it naturally evolves and can be collapsed and digitized, right? You don't need a programmer. And so the tricky part about digital computers, and if you're a programmer yourself or you've programmed at all, you'll know that it is so easy to break a digital system. It breaks, it doesn't work, there's a typo here and the whole thing collapses, right? So digital computations are, in my view, computationally fragile. So while quantum computers are physically fragile, right? They're hard to create. There are these fleeting moments in, in reality, and you have to engineer these little safe spaces to allow a quantum computation to express itself. Once you've created a quantum computer, it is computationally robust. It goes through this annealing process. You evolve your wave function, then you, then you reduce it, and then you evolve it and you reduce it. And that can occur naturally, and it's naturally processing information. But digital computers are constructed out of physical reality. First of all, physical reality is sinking into the quantum foam constantly, and you have to maintain your ones and your zeros very carefully. But even beyond that, the computations that we run in digital computers require high-level programming from humans, right? We need to set up the system to do a thing. And if anything goes wrong in that, in that arrangement, they're kind of these fuddy-duddy, you got to like line it up perfectly. Hence the reason it took so long to make AI in a sense. Um, you have to very carefully arrange the computation and then it starts doing things meaningfully. So I would argue that the quantum computer mind has been evolving through biological infrastructure and simultaneously our bodies are building out the physical vessel that we are within and through evolution we've been building and creating this this digitally trained body of ours and potentially the human brain is the ultimate realization of a digital computer in biology. Now we have this mind which has gotten so much computational power and we've had limited digital resources and now the human brain has greater digital resources and this massive, massive, massive quantum computational entity. And so what I think we're seeing with AI is this is the equivalent of the human brain 2.0. It is a physical vessel that can be manipulated and trained through data to then generate meaningful information itself. And how much is this like the brain except we've perfected the digital computational art to such a degree that we've externalized this process and built these machines which can process digital information better than our own brains. And so in a way, I think digital AI are better than the human brain digitally, and yet they suffer entirely from a quantum computational perspective, right? They need to be trained over many, many hours upon hours of hours of computational processing, and then we get this 200 gigabyte matrix, which can then, you know, run through, you know, that becomes chat GPT and we can interact with it meaningfully. And that's and that's great. However, the quantum computational power of the human brain could be vast, could be enormous. If you subscribe to the microtubule model by Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, you know, these microtubules are serving as these fundamental quantum bits. And so, you know, the number of quantum bits might be related to some topology in the microtubules. You know, check out previous episodes to see more information about that. But depending on how many quantum bits you have, this is a exponential speed up. So two to the hundredth quantum bits um, is 
wild. Like we can't even fathom the computational power of even having a hundred quantum bits. Imagine if the brain has figured out how to make thousands or hundreds of thousands of quantum bits two to the hundred thousandth power, let alone the hundred billionth power. I mean, these are computational powers we can't even fathom. So I think we're in this weird state where the human mind is quantum computationally vast and digitally limited. And now we've created these digital AI, which are digitally vast and don't have this quantum computational capacity. And we are going to augment our experience with these digital AI. One final point just uh, about the evolution of the human brain. It is curious how the brain has such a fine structure and there's certain modules related to different functions. Everyone has a face processing region and a places region and a language comprehension region. You know, could these be weighted matrices similar to ChatGPT that are probably simpler in their construction than ChatGPT, but they have the capacity to process information in a similar way. And so when you are this sort of quantum computing ghost moving around your brain, there's all these evolved instinct-based structures that have been created through evolution and maybe the body has encoded these weighted matrices around your brain and this quantum computer is moving through your brain, that would be you, and it's querying these different structures within you and then getting back some output. And so this would be maybe a model where a early form of our modern AI exists in the brain and this quantum computer is, is, is essentially engaging with small chatbots within your brain. And maybe this could be one way of conceptualizing or thinking about cognition from a sort of evolutionary perspective. All right, final point here, final topic. Okay, what will the future of AI look like in human society? My pitch is that this is the next technology, but hang on to, to your butts because this is not the final technology. In fact, we might see quantum revolutions occurring in the very near future within the order of maybe even 10 or 20 years. Um, and we'll, we'll see what, how that shakes out and what, what that looks like. Okay, so what do I imagine will be happening soon? I think that this is the next calculator. This is the next powerful tool that you can use to empower yourself. Um, I've already heard of so many great applications where you can just speed up your workflow, your thought process. And as you're trying to learn things and use different devices and different tools, this will expedite the process. And I think fundamentally, it's going to empower humans to have so much more capacity cognitively. But this is a externalized cognitive capacity. So another fun prediction I think will happen um, I imagine that we will, in the in probably the very near future, have the ability to own an AI system that is essentially learning about you, right? This is an AI that is trained on your data to help you manage your life and your future and your memories. You know, you could ask it, who is that person I met a few weeks ago that made this big impact on me? I was thinking about this thing and I wrote this thing down. I'll be like, oh yeah, that was so-and-so and here's what they're doing and here's why this was important to you. You know, it'll be able to, to learn your mind more and more and you can sort of grow your knowledge base and your understanding with the assistance of an AI that is trying to map out the space of your knowledge and your understanding to push you to the next frontier. And I think this could be amazing. You could maybe have some privacy around that where only you have access to your AI. You know, maybe that is important to, to people. Um, but I think essentially we're gonna augment ourselves externally. This is external and I do not think AI in this digital form is going to be implanted in our bodies in any way, shape or form. This is external tech. It is the mastery of the physical world. And so it is going to be a physical object device that we interact with 
physically out there. Okay, quantum computers will likely be implanted. <laughs> and this, this is maybe makes uh, us uncomfortable, but I view quantum computers as tapping into something more fundamental. So in a quantum computer, we are assembling raw elements of the universe. And yes, we can harness this for to enhance digital computation, and we will. But quantum computers have the collapse of the wave function. Why is it collapsing into this or that? We don't really know. There are some fundamental mysteries involved in quantum computers that I think will just become more and more apparent as we have better and better digital AI. We will start to see that quantum computers have a little bit of extra secret sauce going on, which is not present in the digital AI, okay? What else is unique about quantum computers? In digital computers, it's parallelized, right? You can train a digital computer in separate servers, it can exist in a distributed fashion. Quantum computers are centralized and they are the equivalent to a mind in a way. They need to be a single entity, and you want to make that entity as big as possible, right? Once you make this large entity, then the computational power goes off the charts. If you cut it in half, you decrease the power exponentially to, uh, to a wild degree, right? So you need one giant quantum computer. Maybe there'll be external ones as well, but here's where the, the wild bit comes in. If your mind is a quantum computer then what we might be able to do in the future is expand the number of quantum bits that comprises your mind. But to do this, it needs to directly interface and become entangled with your mind. And this is unlikely to happen non-invasively. There likely needs to be at least minimal invasion. Maybe it doesn't have to be in the brain proper. You could go through the peripheral nervous system. I don't know but there needs to be some invasiveness to then link up to the human physiology and to expand the quantum computational capacity of your literal mind, okay? So what this would feel like is, right now we have digital AI, it's enhancing our cognition in some external way, making us you know, better at understanding things around us, we can learn faster, we have more access to tools to make products or to make things that improve our lives with quantum computers i think we are going to accidentally stumble into these transcendental experiences and moments what if you take the quantum computer that you buy at your local hardware store and you plug it into your arm or it implants in your brain in this moment your mind itself lights up and expands its processing speed you're thinking bigger, you're thinking wider, you're thinking more. Time dilates and contracts in on itself. Moments freeze and maybe three minutes takes the equivalent of 10 years to occur because cognitively your mind is expanding to such a degree and collapsing at such a fast rate that the entire world shifts into slow motion and the processing speed of your experience elevates to a wild degree and some concluding thoughts on this is that i think we're going to tap into a level of transcendence something that goes beyond how we conceptualize ourselves and the universe right we are embedded in space time we're stuck in the present moment we're having this bizarre absurd experience of being a human being that bizarreness, that absurdity of the moment, of the, the specious moment of our, of our lives is going to be fundamentally altered by this next generation technology. AI is external. This tech might tap into what it is like to be you at its core. And I don't think we understand what's happening with entanglement, your relation to the cosmos, to other individuals, what does this mean for peer-to-peer -peer human connection? Some sort of collective conscious experience where people are interacting with each other. I think this next generation tech might tap into some extra 
aspects of humanity that go beyond the physical domain, right? AI is fundamentally physical. Quantum computation has the potential to tap into things beyond the physical world. And we might find that there's a greater degree of interconnectedness than we once realized. And potentially that next generation technology could be a part of that awakening experience. So I'll leave you with that. A lot to think about. Uh, looking forward to hear what you have to say out there. And I'll talk to you again.